Thanks for coming. Happy Texas Independence Day. 187 years ago today, the Republic of Texas was born. And we're going to talk about its capital. Thanks for coming again. You honor me with your presence. Uh, I suspect I know pretty much everybody, but for those of you who I haven't met, Jim Woodrick, I'm a resident, my wife and I, Francis, for about three years. And uh, Chuck Chat earlier this week, I saw him up here sitting down. And I thought, you know, that's a lot better idea than me standing up all the whole time. So be with me today. And maybe this thing will work. Is that still all right on the volume? Yeah. All right, let's go. I'm as close as I'm going to be. Uh, the, the topic today is, is our city, uh, the capital of Texas. And we're going to go through uh, a little of the history of how, how this place came to be, uh, first the city and then, and then the capital. Uh, a little background, this is a little Texas history background. We've got a, a long history for thousands and thousands of years, different groups of Native Americans lived here. In about the 1690s, the Spaniards started to come and put missions and presidios up. So the first one was El Paso, but mostly uh, in East Texas. Uh, 100 and something years passed. Mexico splits away from Spain and becomes an independent republic. Not many people were living here. They made a big mistake. They looked to the United States and says, any of you people want to come to Texas? And a lot of them did. And so it started about 1822, uh, lots of Americans began to settle in Texas. In 1824, Mexico adopted a constitution which is very similar to the United States. And so the newcomers from, from the United States were pretty comfortable with that. Uh, things changed in 1835. There's this guy named Santa Ana, and he uh, decided that he wanted to be a dictator and became one. He threw out the con Constitution. Several of the Mexican states revolted. He put them down pretty big, and uh, so did Texas revolt. Texas was a the capital of Texas was actually in Louisiana for about 150 years. A place called Los Days. It's in a little town of Robline, Louisiana, between the kind of Shreveport and uh, Natchitoches. And that was the capital of Texas for a long time. And then they closed that place down and moved the capital to San Antonio, where it stayed for about 50-ish uh, years. So that's the first two capitals of Texas right there. Now, here's a little sidetrack. I just found this piece of information, and I wanted to share it with you. You, you, you all heard of Stephen F. Austin. He really wanted to retire right here at Westminster. And, and I'll tell you why I say that. Uh, in 1830, he had just been given this big grant, his fifth grant of land that went from Bastrop up and included this area. And so in 1830, he brings some surveyors, and they come up here to see what in the world they've got. Comanches are all living further west, so there was nobody in Austin. And so he looks around and he, he thought he saw some stuff he liked. Two years later, he's in Mexico City and he sent a letter to his secretary, a guy named Samuel Williams, and he says, secure a tract of land at Cypress Springs by the mountains. And this is from that letter, this picture. And uh, I know that you can't really see it, but he's got mountains drawn right there. That's Mount Bonnell. And he's got uh, number one right there. That's Cypress Springs. There used to be, we have a record of that. It's underwater now but since we built the lake. And number two right there is one of the most beautiful spots that he saw, and that's Laguna Gloria. And if you come along here along this road, you'll see that thing that says Prairie. Camp Mabry, Westminster, and the Grove. That flat <laughs> land that we're living on right now. And in a later letter, Austin said he wanted this land particularly because he was going to come retire here and raise sheep. <laughs> so he's going to live in Westminster and uh, over in Camp Mabry where there's still some pasture, that's where he was going to raise his sheep. It's a true story. Okay, back to the story. So uh, the first troubles came in 1832, uh, and it was over taxes, as you might guess. The 
Texans have been granted a tax holiday by Mexico. So, I, you know, if you'll come, I won't charge you any taxes for 10 years. The 10 years expired, so they put the tax, they put an import tax on, and the Texans didn't like that. So we had a little disturbance in a town on the Trinity River called Anahuac, and had a battle at Velasco on the grasses. And that's kind of the first skirmishes. And then things settled down a little bit, but here comes Santa Ana, and then we had the first really, really battle was at Gonzales, and uh, that happened in uh, late 1835. Uh, the Texans pushed the Mexican army out of Gonzales. They came to San Antonio, ended up taking San Antonio, and moved the, made the Mexican army go back uh, back to Mexico for a little while. But they had a big army, and they came back. We had this famous Battle of the Alamo in 1836. And then uh, also there were about a little less than 400 soldiers, Texas soldiers, who were captured down by Goliad and put in the, in the Presidio there. And they marched about and shot most of them. So we had the Goliad Massacre. And that, those two things really turned the tide in Texas so that they were no longer just fighting against San Antonio. I mean Santa Ana, uh, they wanted independence. So they called, a, they called a convention. It was at a little town called Washington on the Brazos, uh, over kind of above Brenham uh, when you're going down that way. So they convened on March the 1st, uh, 1836, declared independence on March the 2nd, adopted a constitution, again, pretty much patterned after the United States, written by this guy named George Childress, and then learned that the Alamo had fallen and a big Mexican army is coming their way, so they disbanded the convention and ran east. Uh, but before they did that, they organized the government. Uh, Sam Houston was appointed the commander in chief. David Burnett was the was appointed interim president, and they adopted the first Texas flag. You can see it there. Uh, it, was, it was designed by uh, Lorenzo de Zavala, who was the first vice president of Texas. So that's how we got started in 1836. Then, a little later on, we had the big battle at San Jacinto, an overwhelming victory, victory by Texans. Nine Texans died, and 630 Mexicans died. And in addition to that, 730 were taken prisoner, as, as was Santa Ana. So this, this was a huge defeat for Mexico. Santa Ana signed this treaty called the Treaty of Alaska, and he says, uh, we're gonna, the hostilities are going to seize. We're going to exchange prisoners. The Mexican army will leave Texas. I will honor the boundaries that you want, and you're going to release me. And so he signed it, and the Texans signed it. But it really never took effect because the Mexican government refused to accept the fact that Texas left. They still consider Texas a part of Mexico. Uh, here is the Republic of Texas in a map. The boundary from the Sabine River all the way up the Red River, all the way up to Arkansas, all the way up to Wyoming, the 42nd parallel. That boundary was fixed in a treaty with Spain in 1919. And so when Texas declares independence, it doesn't have a western boundary with Mexico. So it says, well, here's what we're going to take. We're going to start at the Rio Grande, and we're going to go all the way up the Rio Grande to its source in Colorado. And we're going to draw that straight line up to the 42nd parallel, and that's the Republic of Texas. Uh, the United States says looks good to us in 1837, so we were an independent nation, but our neighbor uh, said, I honor your boundaries. Now, after San Jacinto, there's a lot going on. Again, David Burnett. Barnett Road uh, was the interim president. We always had problems with Indians, and so they put a little fort here called Fort Colorado uh, so the Texas Rangers could protect it. There's nobody here then, but it's out in East Austin. There's a historical marker out there now. It's Fort Colorado. Uh, Houston was founded in August of that year by a couple of brothers. Uh, most Texans wanted to join the United States and they voted for annexation in September of 1836, and we had an election, and we elected Sam Houston as our first president. 
And uh, in March of 1837, the United States re officially recognized the Republic of Texas, but it says we cannot annex you because we've got a treaty with Mexico that says we won't do things like that with your former territories. So we were told by the United States, we recognize you as an independent republic, but we can't annex you. Uh, we had our first congressional meeting, if you will, uh, uh, in late uh, 1836, going into 1837. It met in a, in a little town called Columbia that almost doesn't exist today. It's down by the wharf on the Brazos River. Uh, that is a picture of what's left of the first House of Representatives uh, in Columbia. Uh, and we said, well, we have to have a capital for this new republic. So we formed a committee, and they said, we recommend one of two places, Nacogdoches, which we all know in East Texas, and the other place was a place called Gross's Retreat. That was a plantation that was between today's Hempstead and Navasota, and they couldn't agree so uh, on which one of those two they wanted, so they said, well, let's try a different approach. Let's ask any town that wants to nominate itself to be the capital to do so. And so they got 15 applications from different towns across Texas, and uh, among those, in, on December the 15th of 37, there was a bill that passed, and they set the capital of Texas at Houston until 1840. They specifically said it'll go, it'll be there until 1840, and then we'll do something different. The next Congress, they're still uh, in a tizzy about what to do for the permanent capital location. Uh, they had another committee make proposals. The committee said, well, we have Washington, we have Bastrop, Washington, Brazos, San Felipe, Gonzales, and then there's this other site that a guy named John Moore lived at, and it's not a town really, but it's 40 miles south of Bastrop, we'll, we'll uh, recommend that site as well. And so they still couldn't decide, so they formed another committee. They met at John Moore's place, and uh, in May the 15th, Congress selected that location on the Colorado River, uh, and they said it was going to be named Austin, and that's today's LaGrange. So the Grange almost was the capital of Texas. But it didn't happen because Sam Houston was still a president and he really wanted the capital to be in that town that was named after him. So he vetoed the bill on the, on the basis of, you know, yet last year we said it's going to be in Houston until 1840. And it's not 1840 yet, so you can't have a new capital. So Houston vetoed it. So we still don't have a permanent location. 1838, uh, a guy named Edward Burleson, who lived between here and uh, about, he lived about where the airport is now. He lays out a new town and he named it Waterloo. And uh, the first settler was a guy named Jacob Harrell. And he lived right at the mouth of Shoal Creek where it runs into the river. Uh, a new president was elected that year, Marbo Lamar, and he was the <coughs> exact opposite of Houston. He had grand plans for the Republic of Texas. He wanted nothing to do with annexation to the United States. He didn't have the words to use, but he wanted manifest destiny. I'm going to take the Republic of Texas all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And that's what wow. he decided that he wanted to do. And, and he withdrew uh, uh, the offer of annexation. Now, he came to Austin in 1838, and uh, the story goes that he was uh, on a hill in, 8th and Con in what's now 8th and Congress, and he looks around and he says, this land should be the seat of future empire. And uh, Jacob Harrell, his son, wrote an account of all this, and Harold said, he, they got an out. The prairie is full of buffalo. So we all decided to go on the hunt. Mar jumps on his horse, rides out amongst all the buffalo. And as you can see, he pulls out his pistol and he shoots this big, big bull buffalo that's running around somewhere, you know, in South Austin. 
So that, that's that's uh, our first, our second president as as he comes to what we become also. All right, we're still fighting. It's 1839, the usual story. We're wrangling over this and that. East Texas versus West Texas. Lamar versus Houston. Do we want to stay in a republic or do we want to be annexed? We're having all these arguments. And so uh, the Congress met again and they passed a bill that said we're going to locate the permanent capital of Texas somewhere between the Colorado and the Trinity Rivers, but it's got to be above Bastrop, the old road to San Antonio. The Nacogdoches went through Bastrop. So the capital's got to be somewhere basically out of the frontier because there's nothing above Bastrop. And that was Lamar saying, I want my capital to be somewhere west because I'm going to head this new republic west and it makes more sense to put the capital out there than it does, let's say, in Houston. So uh, they selected Waterloo to be the new capital and uh, adopted the flag that we now have. That's what it got adopted. And their reasoning for why Waterloo was, again, this is going to be, this place is going to become a big deal. It's going to be the major crossroads of two roads that are connecting Santa Fe to ports on the Gulf of Mexico and going to connect the Red River to Matamoros. That, those two roads are going to cross right here in Waterloo, and that's where we want our capital. So some people wrote what they thought about uh, Waterloo in 1839. The commissioners who, who picked the place, they were pretty positive. They said it was, it was fertile and gracefully undulating woodlands and luxuriant prairies at a distance. And, and they, they thought highly of it. The Ranger Captain uh, James Jones says, you know what? The few people that have been living here are leaving because the Comanches are pretty tough and they're running them out, so there's not going to be many people here. And then there's this guy, Josiah Gregg. He said, certainly nothing could have been more ridiculous and absurd than fixing the seat of government here. So old Josiah didn't have a very good view of all that. So they appointed this guy named Edmund Water to build a new city. Uh, he had a plantation uh, kind of, well, you, you know, the town of Waller on 290, uh, his plantation was near there, it's named after him. So he shows up uh, at this godforsaken place, and he designs the town, he lays out plans, he surveys things, and he gets started building a city. Uh, and you got to have supplies to do that, and there were literally hundreds of wagon loads wagon carts, ox carts, pulling supplies from Houston up the road to, to Austin to be able to have the lumber and everything else it took to build a city. In that same year, early on, a guy named Richard Bullock showed up and built a hotel. So he's got the first hotel in Houston. In October, they're going to have a forced congressional uh, delegation. Uh, Lamar is the president. Houston is the past president. They both come, but they're still bitter enemies, so they don't, they don't come together. Uh, the Fourth Congress convened, and we took a census on, in January of 1840. That's less than a year after we said it's going to be Austin and we started building it. We counted 856 residents, 90% of them were men, and there were 13 taverns in Austin. Waller drew a couple of maps. Here's kind of a, a, a big picture, if you will. And you can see uh, there's his city. That's Shoal Creek, and that's Waller Creek. And that's, uh, that's the Capitol Hill, the site where we're going to put the future Capitol on. Uh, Shoal Creek, that's where old Jesse Harrell lived, right at the Shoal Creek. And by that time, already over across the river, in these really neat springs over there, this guy, uh, William Barton showed up, and he got that land, and he builds his house on what we know today as Barton Springs. Here's a little more close-up of Waters map. I have modified it a little bit to help you. I, I put uh, Congress Avenue and uh, 6th Street in green, so you kind of know uh, where they are. 
uh, and I put the capital in there too, so you know. Uh, and uh, we sold the first lots of a place called the Public Square here. Bullock's Hotel was right there at 6th and Congress. Uh, the first capital was uh, about in that location. Uh, land office, which is probably the most important place in town, that's where the land was given out and the records were kept. Uh, it was uh, about where the, I can't remember the name of the hotel in Congress now. And then the President's House was on a hill where the Omni Hotel is today. So we built the President's House. Built it out of uh, rough cut wood, pine from Bastrop, just buzzed it up in a sawmill, didn't cure it, planked the house, and the wood promptly warped. And so you got this house that looks kind of like a cross between an armadillo and something else. It's got these boards that are all warped and coming out, so it wasn't very pretty. Houston refused to stay in when he was president and came up here, he wouldn't stay in the house. So here's here's the first capital. Uh, it, it was one building, there's a floor plan. It had a uh, big room for the house, big room for the Senate. It had some committee rooms in the back. And then it had a little building behind the capital that was just for a place where the men could drink whiskey and smoke cigars and uh, talk politics. So things haven't changed a whole lot. Uh, you, can, you can see the location at 8th and uh, I guess that's called Water Street. Uh, that, that's, that's the first capital. This is a painting done on January 1st, 1840. Again, this town is, is less than a year old from, from nothing. Uh, a guy named Edward Hall painted this. And uh, he, uh, the city, but you can, you can see it here. Uh, this is the Colorado River in the foreground looking down Congress Avenue towards Capitol Hill, and there's what they call it Pecan Street then, but that's Sixth Street that's going across. Look at all the houses and things that were already built there in less than a year. Uh, let's see, we've got some other stuff here. There's the President's House where the Omni uh, Hotel is today on a little hill. There's the Capitol over there on that side of Congress. There's Bullock's Hotel, 6th of Congress, and there's the land office. Uh, in the vicinity of Bullock's Hotel, and that story will come out here in a little bit. So we're a separate nation. France would like a piece of the action. They sent uh, an ambassador, a guy named Salier, if I pronounce that right. Uh, he builds building called the French Legation. It's still there today. You can, you can go visit it. And the deal was, or the deal that he wanted was, a lot of land because he wanted to attract a bunch of French settlers to come to Texas. And so they had a bill in the Congress that said, we want to provide the three million acres for these Frenchmen. They can bring 8,000 families. And they'll have forts there will be a little France somewhere out there in West Texas. Sam Houston thought that was a good idea, but the people in the Senate did not. And so it failed. And the French ambassador wasn't too happy with that. And uh, he, he made this statement. These people are unbelievably inexperienced and ignorant in all that concerns politics. No idea about anything besides being Americans they have boundless vanity and presumption. And not much has changed. <laughs> so here's, still we're talking about the French ambassador and Mr. Bullock. Now Bullock had a bunch of pigs, and he didn't keep them pinned up and turned them loose. And some of Bullock's pigs went over to the French embassy, and they ate the corn, the ambassador's corn for his horses, they actually went in the ambassador's bedroom and chewed up some stuff. He didn't like that. And he got really mad and he says, your pigs invaded my stable of horses, ate their corn, and went in my bedroom and chewed my papers. And he left town in a huff. So there goes the French ambassador, really mad. Well, it, it took a year that Sam Houston patched up the relations and Selena actually came back to Austin a year later. 
<clears throat> so now Lamar is the president. And again, he's going to take Texas to the Pacific Ocean. The first thing he had to do is remind the people in New Mexico that they were a part of Texas. And, uh, you know, they didn't really think they were. So he organized this big expedition. They left Austin. They had 320 men, a bunch of wagons. They take off. They're going to go to Santa Fe and explain to the New Mexicans how they're part of Texas. Well, they got lost. It was a complete disaster. They nearly all died. The Indians almost got them. They never made it to Santa Fe. They did get into New Mexico somewhere about Tucumcari. The, the New Mexican soldiers come and they have to surrender. And so they sent them all back to Mexico and put them in prison and uh, released them a year later. So there's the first uh, ill-fated expedition of the Mars. Mexico still hasn't given up. It thinks Texas is still a part of Mexico. So they sent an army in January of 1840, and the General Arista says Texas independence is due. And he comes in with a big army. He occupies Victoria, Goliad, and San Antonio, all strongly Hispanic towns at that point in time. And, you know, San Antonio is not that far away from Austin, so uh, the, the people here thought, man, he's coming here next. So we had some cannons, and we set them all up. He never came. Uh, two of the cannons we used were the ones that San Jacinto were called the Twin Sisters. So we set them up at the president's house and pointed them out the river just in case uh, the Mexicans were going to cross over. They didn't. They went back to Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> but then later on that year, another group came back. 1,500 Mexican soldiers came back, reoccupied San Antonio the second time. Again, they're right close to Austin, and they had a couple battles, and finally the Mexican army just, they weren't beat, they just decided to withdraw. So that says to Sam Houston and probably a lot of other people, you know this place, Austin, is not in a good location for a captain because it's too close to where these Mexican soldiers are come back, and it's, it's a threat. So Houston says, he calls an emergency meeting, he said the most important thing this state has is our archives. They're in the land office in Austin. That's the single most important thing we've got. It's our land records. Without that, who knows who owns what? So he sends a group of Texas Rangers to Austin and tells them in the dark of the night, slip in the land office and take all those archives and put them in wagons and bring them to Houston. <clears throat> And they're in the process of doing that. And early that morning, Angelina Everly, who worked for Bullock at his hotel, she goes out just about dawn and she looks across Congress Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. She looks across Af Congress Avenue to the land office, and there's those rangers taking the land records out. They actually got them out. They got them in the wagons. And started off and there was a cannon sitting there that they kept loaded in case the Indians came. So she touches the cannon off, big boom, and it wakes all the men up and they all get organized and form a posse and they get on their horses and they ride out somewhere around Round Rock. They catch up with these wagons and they stop the, the rangers that were in them and they got the land records and the archives and they brought them back to Austin so Austin stayed the captain. That's the second time it, it almost lost it. Uh, you can go down to 6th uh, of Congress today and you'll see that bronze statue of Angelina touching off uh, that cannon. So if you want to you want to thank somebody for Austin being the capital of Texas, you can start with uh, tipping your hat to Angelina Everett. Okay, 1844, Houston's back in charge. Uh, he's re-elected president. Texas again says, all right, we'd like to be annexed to the United States. So they make a proposal. There is a treaty that's signed by diplomats from Texas and the United States. And the treaty says there will be an, act, a, an annexation 
So they put it in front of the U.S. Senate who has to pass on treaties. They rejected it 35 to 16. Thumbs down on Texas. There was a presidential election later that year, and uh, James Polk was running against Henry Clay. Uh, Henry Clay was among those who did not want Texas. So here's one of his campaign posters. Henry Clay and his vice president, who I can't announce, uh, Union Without Texas. Well, Clay lost, and Polk won. And so it wasn't long where, uh, after Polk got in, got in office again, this joint resolution to annex Texas, this time passed the House of the Senate of the United States. Uh, and so President Polk signs it, and he goes to Texas and says, will you merge with us? Will you allow us to annex you? The Texas Congress says, yes, we think it's a good deal. In June, they put it in front of the voters, and 7,000 to 430 said, yes, we want to be annexed. And so uh, it went back to the U.S. House and the Senate. Uh, Polk signed it again. and. Texas has now uh, become a state of the United States. Anson Jones was the last president of Texas. And on February the 19th, at that capital location I showed you, they had a big ceremony where they lowered the, United, the uh, Texas flag, the Republic of Texas flag, and raised up the, the stars and stripes. And Anson Jones made a big speech he said, the final act of this great drama is now performed. The Republic of Texas is no more. <clears throat> Took another census in 1850. Population had dropped 30% since 1840. Uh, we now only had 629 people. But we started to grow uh, significantly in the next 10 years, and we really haven't stopped growing since then. We built our first permanent capital, completed it in 1856. It was on top of the hill there where our current capital is. Uh, there's a picture of it. it burned down uh, in 1881, that capital there. But uh, it said it ain't over until the fat lady sings. That's for the opera. I know my friends, the laymen's must know that one well. Uh, <clears throat> we, we, Texas, formed our own constitution when we became a state. We formed the state constitution. And we said Austin is going to remain our capital until 1850. And then we're going to have a public vote to see where it really is going to be. And we voted in 1850 7,600 for Austin and 3,000 for a town you never heard of in East Texas. Uh, Taylor County. I don't even know if it exists. And we, some voted for Palestine, some for Huntsville. Uh, we couldn't decide, and we set another election for 1872. And when 1872 came along, we had three candidates for the capital of Texas, Austin, Houston, and Waco. And you can see the numbers. Austin won fairly handily. And that finally settled it that in 1872, Austin will be the permanent capital of Texas. Uh, when, our, when the other capital burned, we had this temporary capital for seven years, right across 11th Street from the current capital. I don't, there used to be a little park there now, but anyway, this is the uh, temporary capital of Texas uh, opposite the current capital while we were building a new one. So, even before the capital burned, we knew that we wanted a new grand capital to the state. And we had lots of land, lots of land. So the Congress of Texas in 1876 set aside three million acres up in the Panhandle uh, <clears throat> to provide the funds to build a new capital. Uh, where's Joaquin? Are you still here, Joaquin? Joaquin's our, our person helping us tonight. He's, Joaquin is from Dalhar. 
Dalhart is somewhere right about there. And I was telling him a while ago, uh, what people say about Dalhart is there's nothing between Dalhart and the North Pole but a bob wire fence and some tumbleweeds. <laughs> but, but at any rate, three million acres up there. And so now our capital burns down, so we need to cash in on that land and get some money to build a new one. So we sold it to a group of investors, most of whom were foreigners, uh, and they named it the XIT Syndicate, or 10 in Texas. I think there were 10 investors. And they paid the state of Texas a dollar an acre for those three million acres. And they had a big ranch called the XIT Ranch. And that gave Texas enough money to build the capital that we have today. We made it from Texas Red Granite. The largest pink granite quarry in the United States is up here at Marble Falls. That's where we got the rocks that, are, that make up our capital today. And we finished it in 1888. There it is, just as it has been almost finished. And the only thing left to do is to raise our goddess of liberty up to the top of the capital, which we did. And uh, she's still there today. We did have to replace her here a few years ago. She got a little corroded with the pollution in the air. And we had to replace her, but that's another story. Uh, she still looks just like she did before. So here, here's two goddesses of liberty. This one you recognize, that's the United States Statue of Liberty. That goddess of liberty has got the book of law in one hand, and she's holding up the torch of freedom in the other hand. Over here is the Texas goddess of liberty. She's got a sword in one hand, and she's holding up the lone star in the other. If, uh, you want to read a really good book about the story that I just told you, I recommend this one. It's a guy named Kerr, lives here in Austin, called Seat of Empire, uh, The Battle of Birth of Austin, Texas. And that ends my talk. <laughs>